Hi, my name is Tyler Compton. I'm a product manager at Out2 AI, and today we're going to be talking about video processing with Python. After this talk, you're going to be able to decode a video stream, apply some cool effects to it, and show it on screen. And we're going to be doing all this using the GStreamer library, which is a very powerful and extensible framework that the pros are using to push the industry forward. But don't be intimidated. GStreamer makes it very easy to do some pretty impressive things, and we're going to be going through every step of the process. If at any time you fall behind during this talk, don't worry about it. I have a text version of the talk available that you can look at later, and there should be a link to it in the description. Let's start by installing everything we need to use GStreamer with Python. This is probably the hardest part, so if you manage to do this before the talk, it's all smooth sailing from here. If not, no worries, we're going to be covering how to install everything on Windows 10 right here. I would recommend opening up the text version of this talk, because I'll have links to the stuff we'll be downloading, and you'll probably want to copy and paste a few of the long commands we'll be running. If you're running on Mac OS or Linux, you'll find separate instructions for how to install everything for those platforms as well. We're going to be using a tool called msys2 to download and install everything we need. msys2 makes it easy to set up development environments on Windows. Download the latest stable release of msys2 from the releases page. Then run the installer, accepting all the defaults, but unchecking run msys2 at the end. Once it's installed, start msys 2 mingw 64 bit from the Start menu. Make sure not to use any of the other msys 2 options. This will open up the msys 2 terminal. Let's get msys 2 up to date by running the following command. After this command finishes, it may need to close. Just open it right back up again. Now we're ready to install everything we need. The following command installs GStreamer, some plugins, Python, and the PyG object library. While you're waiting for everything to install, let's take a step back. A wise scholar once said, before you decode the video, you need to understand the video. You need to be the video. At a fundamental level, video is presented to viewers as a list of images that are shown one after the other at a high enough speed for our eyes to see it as a moving picture. Pretty simple, right? Well, there's just one problem. Storing all these thousands and thousands of images takes up a huge amount of space. An average 10 minute YouTube video would require over 100 gigabytes of storage, and a feature length movie could take upwards of a terabyte. Where is our escape from this madness? Well, luckily, mathematicians and computer scientists have found many clever and sophisticated ways to compress video data down to a fraction of its original size. These researchers have turned their work into standards that define exactly how their technology works and how video data that is compressed in this way can be decoded. We call these standards video compression formats, and some popular ones include H.264, VP8, and AV1, among many others. All the while, other smart people need to figure out in what way the compressed video data should be saved to a video file, or split into chunks and streamed over the internet. The result is the development of special formats that hold both the compressed video data and additional information, like the title of the video, its resolution, and other stuff too. We call these container formats, and some popular ones include MPEG-4 and WebM. So in the end, you use a video camera to record something, those raw images get compressed into a video compression format, and once you're done, your video is wrapped up with a nice little bow using a container format. Now, the video file is ready to be stored on your computer or streamed out for all the world to see. So, now that we know how video works, we can begin to understand how GStreamer lets us work with it. Working with GStreamer is kind of like creating an assembly line in a factory. Each step in the assembly line is in charge of doing one thing, 
and the results of one step are passed on to the next step until the process is complete. GStreamer calls this assembly line a pipeline, and the steps are known as elements. Every pipeline starts with a source element, has some number of elements that process data in the middle, and ends with a sync element. The source element is in charge of getting video data from somewhere, like a file on your computer or a video stream hosted online. That data is then passed to the next element, which does some processing on the data, and the result is passed on to the next element in the pipeline, and so on. Finally, the fully processed data is passed to the sync element, which will take care of making the data available somewhere. That might involve saving it to your computer, hosting it as a live video stream, or passing it back to your application. GStreamer has lots of elements that do all kinds of different things. Each one has a name that we refer to them by, and certain rules governing what kinds of data it can take as input, and what it produces as output. Now, putting together one of these pipelines might sound hard, but GStreamer makes it pretty easy. All you have to do is give GStreamer a string with the names of each element you want in your pipeline separated by exclamation marks, and that's it. GStreamer will take care of creating these elements and attaching them to each other, and you've got yourself a fully formed pipeline. All right, so with all that introduction out of the way, let's jump into the code. So you're going to need some kind of text editor to write code, of course. Um, I'm using Visual Studio code here, but you can use whatever you like. Even Notepad is fine. Um, so I'm going to open a folder here and we're going to put our code under, if you click on this PC and go to C, msys64, home, and then this directory says Tyler in my case, but it will say something different for you, unless your name is Tyler, I guess. Um, and then I'm going to make a new directory in here and I'm going to call it gstreamer learning, but you can call it whatever you like. And then I'm going to select that folder to work in there. And then I'm going to create a new file and I'll just call it main.py. So we're writing in Python, but GStreamer is a C library. So we're going to be using what's called a binding. And a binding is just a little adapter that takes care of allowing you to use a library from one language in another language. And it handles all the necessary conversions to make that all work. And the name of the bindings that we're using for GStreamer is called pygobject. And we can import pygobject by running import gi. So gi refers to pygobject, which is actually a binding for a few different libraries, not just GStreamer. So we're not talking to GStreamer yet. So before we do that, we need to tell pygobject what the minimum GStreamer version that our program needs is. So we do that by doing gi.require version. And then we, t we tell it what library we're interested in, which is GStreamer, which is in, in this case is shortened to GST. And then the minimum version we need is 1.0. Okay, now that we've done that, we can import GStreamer. So we do that by running from gi.repository import GST. Now we finally got GStreamer, we can be doing some GStreamer stuff. And the first thing that you always have to do is call gst.init. That just takes care of initializing some state in the background that we don't have to care too much about. But it's really important that you call that before you do anything else because you'll get some weird errors if you don't. So let's just try running this just to make sure that our environment is set up correctly. So I'm going to start msys2 mingw 64 bit. And then I want to go, the, go to the directory that I'm saving the code in. So I'm going to run cd and then the name of the directory, which I named gstreamer learning. And if you run ls, you can see what's in the directory and we can see our main.py. So in order to run it, I just have to run python3 and then the name of the file, main.py. And it doesn't really do anything because we haven't really added much code yet, but there are no errors. So I'm gonna call that a success. So the next thing we need to do is start the main loop. And the main loop is in charge of passing some events around and doing some operations in the background that we tell GStreamer to do. So first we need to import another thing from gi.repository, which is called glib. And then we will create the main loop by doing glib.mainloop and just constructing it. And so the way that we start the main loop is by calling mainloop.run. 
but if we were to do that here, our code would stop right here because the main loop runs for as long as it's allowed to run. We actually have to tell it to stop in order for it to stop blocking at that line. So what we're going to do instead is to run it on a separate thread so we can keep doing other stuff in our code. So threading in Python is super simple. You just do from threading, import thread, uh, create a new thread, whose target is to run main loop dot run, and then we'll start that thread immediately. So we've got our main loop started and we can get into creating our pipeline. In order to make creating our pipeline easy, we're going to be using that special syntax that I showed you earlier. And the way we do that is by doing pipeline equals and then gst.parse launch. And parse launch just takes a string with that syntax of elements separated by exclamation marks. So every pipeline starts with a source. And for this pipeline, I want to stream video from my webcam and show it on screen. So my source should be something that can read from a webcam. For Windows, that's KS Video SRC. Although, uh, depending on your platform, it's going to be different. So Mac OS users should use Auto Video SRC and Linux users should use V4L2 SRC. But the rest of the pipeline will be the same. The next element I'm going to put in is decode bin. And decode bin is a super handy element that is capable of decoding just about anything. It's actually a bin, which means that it's an element made of more elements under it. And it's able to detect exactly what format is being fed to it and choose the right decoder. Uh, so that it can provide us raw images. It's super handy. The next element we're going to put in is video convert. And video convert is another really handy element that takes care of doing any necessary color conversions to make sure that the data you're getting out from the element to the left of the video convert is compatible with the element to the right of it. And speaking of which, we just have one more element to put in and every pipeline starts with a source and ends with a sync and I'm going to use auto video sync. And auto video sync takes care of displaying the video to the screen. So we've got our pipeline, but we're not done yet. We still need to tell GStreamer to start it up. By default, pipelines are in the null state, which means no data is passing between them and it's not ready to go yet. So we want to ask GStreamer to set the pipeline to the playing state. And we do that by running pipeline, dot set state and gst dot state dot playing. Now this call just asks gstreamer to do something. The actual work happens on the main loop in another thread. So our code just continues and it may take a little bit for the pipeline to get going. So with that in mind, we need to do something in the code so that the code doesn't just exit before the pipeline has a chance to do anything. So I'm just going to create a busy loop here that just sleeps for a tenth of a second constantly. And uh, in order to add a way for us to stop this application, I'm going to catch a keyboard interrupt. And uh, if you're not familiar, keyboard interrupt is an exception in Python that is thrown whenever the user presses control C while the application is running. And I'm just going to pass. So that's our way of exiting out of the loop. The last thing we need to do uh, is once the application is closing, we need to clean the pipeline up. And we do that by asking GStreamer to set its state to null. And this will take care of uh, disconnecting everything, cleaning everything up, and stopping the pipeline. Then we're going to stop the main loop. And we're going to stop the main loop thread. All right, I think things are looking pretty good. Let's give it a run. And hey, there I am in all my low frame rate glory. So I think that my webcam's frame rate is bad because I'm running in a VM, but yours should be nice and smooth. Uh, so I'm just going to exit this application by, running, by pressing Control C in the terminal. And you can see everything exits nice and clean. Now that we've got our example application running, let's add some cool effects to the webcam stream, just because we can. Some of my favorites are Edge TV and Ripple TV. 
They look like those old effects on Photo Booth, you know, the ones that you'd mess around with in school when you were supposed to be doing work on the MacBooks. Just make sure to add a video convert element between them so that we can make sure that the effect element is getting images in a format that it's compatible with. So before we wrap things up for today, I just wanted to show you one more thing. So GStreamer has a lot of elements, right? For doing all kinds of things. But what if you wanna do something custom? Maybe you wanna implement your own cool filter or you want to send the video frames out to some other project or application. Well, GStreamer has a sync for that and it's called AppSync. So in order to use it, we're going to get rid of Ripple TV here and replace auto video sync with AppSync. And in order to use AppSync, we actually need to pull the element out of the pipeline. And to make that easier, I'm going to give it a name. And I'm just going to call it Sync. So this allows us to get the AppSync out of the pipeline by using pipeline.getByName. And then we're going to just give the element's name. And now that we have a reference to the AppSync, we can start getting images from it. So all that you have to do is run AppSync.try pull sample and try pull sample we'll try to get a sample from the app sync and a sample is just an image in this case and it takes a timeout so i'm going to give it a timeout of gst.second this means that if a sample is not available from the app sync within a second it will just return none and give up so i'll just check to see if the sample is none And uh, if it is none, we're just going to try again. So I'm just going to do continue. And then I'll print, I got a sample. OK, now let's run this and see what happens. And it doesn't work. We get an exception. GSD app sync object, so our app sync, has no attribute try pull sample. So did I get the method name wrong? Well, no, I didn't. Um, this is a really tricky part of GStreamer and something that you're just going to have to remember. If you use AppSync, you have to import something else called GST app. And if you don't do that, then all of the AppSync's methods won't be available, like try pull sample. And we also need to add a new require version line here to tell it what version of GST app we want to use as well before we import it. So yes, this is pretty tricky considering we don't even use this import directly, but it's just kind of a weird consequence of the way GStreamer works. One thing I like to do is um, just do this, um, you know, assign GST app to underscore. It doesn't do anything, but it keeps tools from getting rid of this import thinking that it's not necessary when in fact it is. Okay, so with that little gotcha in mind, let's try running it again. All right, there you go. And you can see that we're getting samples and my samples are rolling in pretty slowly because my webcam's frame rate is messed up. But for you, it's probably going to print a whole bunch of things. So obviously this isn't very interesting, right? I'm not doing anything with the sample. And the reason why is because what you do with this sample depends a lot on what your end goal is, right? What you're going to use the image from the video stream for. And it actually gets pretty complex. So I'm going to just leave it here for this talk. Uh, but the text version of the talk will have an example of using AppSync with NumPy so that you can do color conversions and stuff with uh, OpenCV or just with NumPy directly. So if that interests you, please take a look at that. And that is a wrap. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you found it enjoyable. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me on the SunHacks Discord. Again, my name is Tyler, and I should be marked as a mentor. All that to say, best of luck to everyone, and happy hacking.